All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 1st of February, 2006, approximate, approximately 11.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Charles Allen Hunt. Um, I'm 61 years old. Date of birth is December 18th, 1944, and I was born in Troy, New York. What was your educational background prior to entering service? I'm a high school graduate from Greenwich High School in Greenwich, New York. Okay. Um, did you uh, enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Why did you enlist? Well, I wanted to go into the military police because my, uh, my future plans were to become a state trooper. And I figured I'd go to the military police, put in my three years, come out and, and go on to be a state trooper. Why did you, so you picked the Army so you could be a... That's an MP, right, okay. Um, where did you go for your basic training? Basic training was Fort Dix, New Jersey. And when did you enter service? Um, it was August of 64. Um, I'm not sure the date, I think around the 23rd, 24th of August. Okay. Um, could you describe your basic training, um, your experiences, if um, all, did anything stand out more than others? Yeah, basic training was an education for me. Um, being from Greenwich, I had never been away from home before. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, uh, furthest I'd been away from home was to West Point to see a football game when I was in high school, and it was entirely different for me to, to meet different people, uh, different ethnic people, and whatnot. Um, got a real education. I can always remember when we got down there on the bus. Uh, we get off the bus and we said we had to go to the training battalion and the guy said, sure, I'll take you. And we jumped in his taxi. He drove around the bus station and let us out because it was right alongside the bus station, charged us 50 cents. <laughs> that was my education, my first education in the service. Uh, how long were you in basic? Basic, uh, eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And did where did you go uh, from there for any specialized training? Yes, I went to uh, uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, to uh, MP school. How long was that school? MP school, I think, was a six-week school, as I remember. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the, the things you learned there that were, were different than basic? Well, uh, um, they took us through convoy control, uh, uh, orienteering, uh, we learned how to read a map and, and use a compass. Um, they learned, we learned um, quite a few things about, you know, like I say, convoy control. Uh, we did some hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, we learned how to, to patrol downtown. Um, Jeep training, we had extensive Jeep training. Uh, but I think the most important thing I got out of that was the, was the map reading and the, and the uh, use of a compass. Mm -hmm. Did you get um, any advanced weapons training too? None whatsoever. Um, like I say, in basic training, the only thing I did was throw one hand grenade mm -hmm. um, and qualify with an M14. When I went to MP school, we qualified with a 45. And other than that, that was the only actual training I had um, in weapons. Okay. After you left uh, Fort Gordon, where did you go? Well, it was interesting. Um, I graduated in the top ten of my class, and I thought I wanted to go to West Point, but a sergeant pulled me aside and he said, you don't want to go to West Point. He said, you want to go to um, U.S. Army School in Oberammergau because they had given us a choice, the guys in the top ten of the class, where we would go. And uh, I chose that and was lucky enough to get it, so I went to Oberammergau, Germany, to a uh, NATO school. Now, would you have been a, an MP at West Point? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. And that's where I thought I went. But he said, mm -hmm. he said, you've lived in New York all your life. He said, you want to go see some of the world. And, and I, I, I'm happy he told me that because mm -hmm. it did give me a chance to, to go to Europe and get a, get a good view of Europe. When I was in Europe, I uh, took a 30-day leave. We went to 13 different countries, traveled around, and, and got to see quite a bit about you, quite a bit of Europe. Now, what was your duty assignment in Germany? I was a military policeman there. Um, it was a NATO post. It was a, a restricted post. Uh, you had to have a secret security clearance or higher to even get on the post. Uh, wives, 
um, friends and whatnot were not allowed on the post. Uh, we did gate guard. Um, we did uh, NATO secure building security, and um, we did um, escort of high-ranking um, military people from probably six or seven different countries. Uh, I can remember we had one class there that had uh, five four-star generals from three different countries. Uh, it had two-star generals, three-star generals. The lowest guy in the class was a bird colonel. So we, we usually saw people of rank at our post. Now what were your work conditions like there? Very nice. Uh, two men to a room. Uh, we had people that cleaned our rooms. You lived on post? Yes, on post. Uh, two men to a room. Uh, we had people that cleaned our rooms, hardwood floors, uh, nice bunks, uh, nice lockers. Um, it was like uh, you worked six days on, three days off, um, no night duty at all. All day duty it was it was like a it was like a day job. Very nice. Did you 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 said you went on vacation, got a thirty day leave uh, to travel around? Uh, how about um, when you had time off? Did you go into the villages? Oh yeah, and yeah. Over Amargau, you have to understand. Um, Over Amargau is like the land of Heidi. The the barns are attached to the houses. They actually take the goats and the, and the cows up on the side of the mountain to graze every day and bring them back down and milk them. I um, mean, it's old Germany. It's it's the Bavarian, typical Bavarian area, um, just a beautiful area. We used to travel in that area extensively uh, on our days off because it was just such a nice, you could go down to Garmisch Partenkirchen, which was um, the military's, uh, um, I would say, R&R &R center in, in Europe. Uh, which was very nice. Uh, we had all the facilities we could use down there. Um, we had we had uh, many chances to go down into Switzerland and northern Italy on our three-day passes because we were only like 90 minutes from Innsbruck. So we would take advantage of that and, and do things like that. It, it was very enjoyable. Munich was only an hour away by train, so we'd go up to Munich a lot. Um, and it really, it really was a nice area to, to to live in. How long were you there? I was there about a year and a half. And then what happened to you? Well, <laughs> one morning I was laying in my bunk, and, and uh, they came in and threw orders on my chest, and the sergeant said, "You're going to Vietnam." And uh, I said to him, "You've got to be kidding!" I said, "You know, this is a joke." And I had friends in the personnel department. I figured they had just printed up some orders and were pulling my leg, so I didn't worry about it. I just went back to sleep, and, and about 2 o'clock, I went down and had lunch and went over to the personnel department, and a good friend of mine who worked in there, he said, what's this? And he said, this is no joke. He said, these came from the Pentagon last night. You and two other guys, uh, Tom Flaherty and, and uh, another fella, we were headed for Vietnam, and we had uh, 30 days to get there. So uh, within 10 days, I was out of Germany. I had a 15-day leave in the States, and uh, then I went to Oakland, California to leave, for, uh, to leave for Vietnam. I was assigned to the 504th MP Battalion in Vietnam. And now the fellows that were with you, did they end up in the same unit? Unfortunately not. My orders said 504th MP Battalion. Their orders said replacement unit at Tonsonu, and uh, it, was, it was quite interesting because when we got there, um, we, every morning they'd fall you out for formation and they'd start calling out people for their different units. And I was there two days along with these other two fellas and we hadn't been called out. Finally on the third day, the other two fellas' names were called and they went to the Big Red One. And uh, which was on the Delta at the time. And I stayed there actually two more days uh, waiting for my orders, and then I finally did go up to Quinyan, where the 504th MP Battalion was based, and I joined up my unit. One of the fellows, I know for a fact, did not go as an MP. He wound up being an infantryman in the Big Red One. Now, what was your impression when you first landed in Vietnam, as soon as you got off the plane? Well, it, 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 it was interesting because when we were circling 
Saigon and, and getting ready to land, you really didn't, it, it hadn't hit you what, what you were going to, what you were going to or where you were going. It was just like, you know, you're going to land in another city and, and, and get off and, and uh, uh, you know, that, that's where you're going to be. But when we landed, um, I always go back and I can't remember which movie it is, but when they open the back of a C-130 and the hot air hits you in the face, that's the way it was getting off that plane. I mean, we had gone from San Francisco or, or Oakland where the temperature was probably around 70. They flew to Anchorage, Alaska, where it was zero. And then the next place we landed was Saigon, and it was like 85 and humid. And, and uh, uh, I always remember the... the when they open that door and you walked out, it just it just hit you. The air, just the, the moisture and the heat, just hit you. And um, it was confusing. A lot of things going on. They loaded us up on deuce and a half to take us over to. Uh, I think it was uh, Long Ben was where the was where the uh, the you know incoming processing center was. And they loaded us up on deuce and a half, and we drove through Saigon. And, we're all waving and howling like we're Second World War heroes, you know, uh, uh, going through town. And the Vietnamese are all yelling in Vietnamese words that I really wouldn't repeat on this interview. But uh, we got there, and, and and they put us into the into the uh, into the replacement unit there. And like I say, I stayed there five days before I went up north to Quinh Um It was it was an interesting quite a, again. You still didn't realize what you were into um, because you were within the post. Uh, we, we hadn't, you know, we hadn't been issued any weapons. We hadn't, you know, we were just we were just there and, and milling around and waiting for our paperwork. And they fed us every day, and, and it was just like the regular army. Now, when did you arrive in Vietnam? Um, it was in September, probably around the fifteenth of September of '66. Um, when you were arrived at the unit that you were assigned, um, did they, they gave you your equipment, weapons? Well, that, 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 that was interesting also because I guess one thing I'd like to go back to Saigon, the first night we were there, uh, Tansanu got boarded. And it was the first time we were under fire or, or had any idea of what was going on. And, and it was interesting because you could hear them and the ground was shaking and whatnot, and they told us to lay on the floor and put our mattresses over the top of us from our bunks. And we're laying there and we're giggling because we're thinking this is funny. You know what I mean? Because you can hear it, the ground shaking and, and whatnot. And then finally they were getting closer, and they got so close that you could hear the stones hitting on the metal roof. And then it started to really sink into you that, that this just wasn't, a drill, or it wasn't what we'd gone through in basic training, where they where they trained us and whatnot. This was for real. And the next morning, we went out, and there were there was a helicopter port right next to us, and they had hit two or three of the helicopters, and you saw the damage and whatnot. And it really did sober me up as to what we were in for. Um, when I went up to Quinyan, uh, got to my unit. Um, our unit had just got there, like. I would say probably three or four months before I joined them. Um, because they were short-staffed, they had put a hundred or almost a hundred privates right out of MP school into their unit, and they had pulled ranking cadre. cadre. I was an E4 at the time. They pulled me and, and several others from Europe to be to build a rank strength up in the unit because they were they were under strength. And um, our headquarters company was was based in Quinyan, and then each one of our companies were attached to different units in different areas. Like uh, A company, I think was in was at ANK. I think B company was was up at Play Coup. Um, I was going to be attached to the C company, which was the company I was in. We were attached to the First Cav, and they were out on. Um, Highway 1 headed north towards Bangsan with what their basic mission was, was Operation Thayer 1 that, that they were involved in and, and uh, we joined up with them when they were at, in, actually in that, that uh, operation. Um, it was interesting because like I say, 
Yeah, the second day I was there, they brought us out and they said, you're going to the field today and, and uh, started handing me a steel pot, flak vest, uh, um, M16, which I had never fired, never taken apart, never cleaned, never handled. Um, I had trained with an M14. Um, live hand grenades, they gave us live hand grenades and whatnot, and they said, uh, you're going north. So they took, there were about six or eight of us, they put us on a pickup truck, or on a uh, two and a half ton truck. Uh, we went up and waited with the convoy that was going north and, and started north. And we got up about halfway up, and uh, the driver in the truck says, anybody know how to handle a 50 caliber machine gun? And we all looked at each other and said, we had no idea whatsoever how to handle a 50 caliber. On this truck, they had on a turret, they had a 50 caliber machine gun, and he wanted one of us to man it, but none of us knew how to use it, so we declined and went on our way. Uh, he said, everybody lay down on the bed of the truck. So we all laid down on the bed of the truck and went on about probably another half hour to 45 minutes over this bumpy road. He finally yelled, well, we're here, Camp Hammond. So we all start peering up out of this truck, and there's this huge hill, and it's got a big, probably... 12 to 14 foot high cav shield on it and that's all you could see and you could see all the way around it you could see that there were military tents and whatnot and huge clouds of black smoke coming up and I looked at the other guy and I said oh my god I said they must have got overrun or hit last night I said the place is still burning you know so we pull in there and uh go to our unit, they drop, it off, drop us off with our unit. Our unit, uh, we lived in shelter halves, dug uh, foxholes four foot deep, put a shelter half over the top of it, and that's how we lived. We didn't have any, we got some, some bigger eight-man tents later on, but when we first started, um, we just had to pick wherever we could find and, and, and set up camp, and, and that's where you lived. But uh, I soon found out what the black smoke was all about. Because in the military, uh, when they have latrines, they take barrels and cut them in half. And you use those for your latrine, and every day somebody gets a turn to burn them. And uh, what they do is they dump fuel oil into them and set them on fire to burn off the, uh, the waste material in these, in these barrels. And my next job was to do that job. So I learned why the camp looked like it had been overrun and why it was burning or why it, the smoke was coming up because everybody was taking care of their latrines that day. So that was that was another quick education that I got that, that uh, kind of makes you makes you a little smarter about Vietnam. What was daily life like there? Um, our day consisted of uh, you get up probably around 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, we did not have any support units with us, so what we were expected to do was eat sea rations, but what we tried to do was buddy up with the first cab and use some of their mess facilities and whatnot. So what we would do is get up 5 o'clock in the morning, try to go over to a, a find a mess kitchen that was operating that belonged to the first cab, and we'd hopefully eat with them if they'd let us. Um, most of the most of the medical units there were pretty good, and they'd let us in, and we'd, we'd eat with them in the morning. Um, you had to be out on the road by about six o'clock in the morning because the convoys would start forming up, and um, we would wait till we got a convoy that was going to be headed north to uh, escort, and that was our job. We'd escort them. Um, usually, first thing in the morning, we would take a group of engineers north, and the engineers were usually working on the roads or they would go with a minesweep truck in front of us to check the road for mines and whatnot. We'd run from from uh, this little base that we were at, Camp Hammond, which was just outside of Phuket, um, and we would work our way north to, to uh, different jump-off points that they had for these convoys. Well, um, the engineers would go out with their minesweep vehicles usually a five-ton truck um, that was well-armored and, and weighted down with sandbags and whatnot. 
Uh, sometimes they'd have guys running, riding on the bumper with their hand mine sweeps to see if they could pick up, pick up anything. Sometimes they wouldn't. Um, but we'd go up the road, we'd sweep the road to try to make sure that it was clear, go back, pick up the convoy, and take that north. Um, we would meet them at 6. They would form from 6 to probably about 9. We would get back at about 9 and then take that convoy north, escort it north. Um, and that was basically our job. Once we got them north, we'd wait till they got unloaded. We'd form them up again, and then we'd bring them back. Um, we'd get back usually around 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, uh, see if we could scrounge a meal someplace and, and go to sleep because you had to be up 5 the next day. It was 7 days a week. Um, 365 days, uh, no days off, no, no time to, to think about what was going on, just you got up the next day and went to work. You were talking earlier about being involved in some of the operations uh, around Landing Zone Bird and so on. To yeah, um, that, that happened on, and, and Christmas for me, it, it, it is not a happy time because it happened on the 28th of December. Um, and every year, I get this, right after Christmas, I get a gloomy feeling uh, because this whole thing rushes back to me. And it was the 28th of December in 66. Uh, they woke us up at about 1 o'clock in the morning. And all we knew was that an LZ was being overrun and they needed to get as many people up there as they could to try to, 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 you know, clean this thing up and, and save it. Um, they took us out on the runway, and, and we waited from about 1.30 to about 4.30 to uh, load up on helicopters and, and go north. Um, they were ferrying people all the time at that time up there. Uh, we sat out on the end of the runway. It was pouring rain, uh, dark. Uh, you just had your shelter half over you and you just sat there and you knew where you were going and you just couldn't go quick enough because you wanted to go and get it over with rather than sit on the end of that runway and wait your turn to go. Um, I think it was the longest three and a half hours of my life was sitting on the end of that runway waiting to get in the helicopter. Once we got in the helicopter and got moving, then it was on and, and, and you know, everything was all right. You knew, you knew that, you know, you were gonna, you were gonna be doing what you had to do. Um, we flew up there, got over the, uh, got over LZ Bird, and uh, got a radio message. And you could see, you could actually see fire. You could see them firing into the compound. You could see firing going out of the compound. Um, and, and we got down low enough where, where we got close to the LZ, and they had knocked a helicopter down in the LZ ahead of us, and we couldn't land. So they pulled us back up. Uh, we circled for probably another half an hour around that area. Then they flew us to LZ Pony, which was about five miles away. Um, they set us down there. This is probably around 5.30 in the morning. Still dark, still raining. Um, set us down and, and told us that uh, we had to get over to LZ bird right away because it was still under siege. So what they did is they formed us up into platoon sized units and send us out to go to LZ bird. It was about a five mile hike through the woods from LZ pony to LZ bird. Uh, I happened to be in charge of my group. They told us that uh, about every quarter of a mile they had a, a guy sitting out there and he would tell us what direction to go you know, for the next quarter mile. Well, first time out, we hit the first guy, and it was great. And second time, we go and hit the second guy, and it was great. And third time, we're going along, and I'm not finding this guy. And uh, get a little worried and look to a couple of the other guys in the group, and I said, let's stop right here. And I said, we'll wait till the next unit that's coming behind us, the next group behind us comes. And I said, we'll be at least a bigger unit. If something happens to us, you know, we'll be together. Well, soon the other group caught up to us. So now instead of being 34, we were 68 together. And we decided we'd go a little further to see if we could find the guy, which we did. And he pointed us in the right direction. Um, 
we got to LZ Bird, I would say, between 6 and 6.30. Uh, by then, the North Vietnamese had pulled back. Um, there were probably two to 300 of the 1st Cav people, infantry people there, uh, along with us who, who joined them. Um, and they were pursuing the North Vietnamese up into the valleys away from, away from this uh, uh, LZ. The LZ was actually a, an artillery unit. They had about 180 people there. Um, they had uh, 105s and 155s there. They had, I think, uh, like six or eight 105s, and then they had like four or five 155s there. Um, and the North Viet Vietnamese had actually penetrated the perimeter. Um, they had gotten to the CP. Uh, they had damaged four of the guns and then pulled back when, when we came to, to relieve them. Um, unfortunately, there were 36 Americans killed that day and, and uh, about 278 North Vietnamese were killed that, that night. Um, our job was to, was to secure the perimeter, uh, clean up the mess, and, and I spent two days there. Uh, the 28th, the 29th, and the 30th. Um, at night we pulled bunker guard because they did come back. They did probe us a little bit. Um, and to try to, to, to re-secure the, the, the base. Uh, on the 30th they did bring us back down to our unit. But it was a long three days for me. Now that's the action you showed us. Uh Showed me earlier, SLA Marshall wrote about that. Uh, yes, yes, book. it's in a book, um, uh, The Battle of Bird, mm -hmm. um, and it's by Marshall. Uh, I have that book, and, and it has maps and, and pictures of, of, of things that I saw in the days that I were there. was there. Um, it has uh, the whole battle laid out and how the battle uh, it starts actually about three or four weeks before the battle, the North Vietnamese side of it, the American side of it, uh, right up to the night of the battle, and then it goes after that also. Uh, fortunately, uh, I was lucky enough to find this book, uh, and, and I have it in my possession, which is, which is a treasure to me. Now, uh, were you involved in any other actions like this? Or, or? Yes, uh, there's, there's two other, two other actions that I can think of. We we would go a week, week and a half with nothing happen. Mm -hmm. Then you'd maybe go down the road and, and, and they'd throw a little lead at you and then they'd melt off into the bush just to, just to keep you honest. Um, and that's the way it would go. You'd, you'd go three or four days with nothing happening. Then you'd go two or three days that, that you'd find something going on. Um, our, biggest, our biggest fear was mines in the road. Um, taking taking convoys north, uh, the Vietnamese would, would come out in the middle of the night because they owned the night and we owned the day. And uh, they would dig and set mines in the road. You'd go out the next morning and dig them out or run over them if you, if you didn't find them. Um, and then it would be the same thing all over again. Um, I always remember one morning when we were waiting for the convoy to form up uh, we used to stop all traffic going up the road while our minesweep team was out there. And uh, we had a, a Vietnamese bus that was loaded with people on top of the bus and hanging out the windows and all this stuff and everything else. They came up to our checkpoint and they wouldn't stop. And they went right through our checkpoint. Well, we jumped in our Jeep to chase them down and the minesweep team was probably only about a mile and a half up the road. They passed the minesweep team and hit a mine. Uh, on that bus, there were 19 Vietnamese killed and numerous wounded. Uh, and we came right up afterward, you know what I mean, uh, into that. And uh, that was that was a long day uh, to, to see something like that. Um, I have one other sheet that I have here. It was actually made the Army Stars and Stripes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we used to take the engineers north and set them up so they could work on the roads. We'd go back and pick up our convoys. And uh, one morning, uh, 
just north of LZ English, we uh, set them up. They had a gravel pit where they were working on the road, and we used to take them up there. They'd sweep the gravel pit, sweep the area. We'd leave them, go back and pick them up at night and bring them home. Well, that morning we pulled in to, uh, to leave them there, and we were just kind of checking the thing out there, actually looking for mines with a, with a hand minesweeper and uh, the first three mortar rounds were direct hits on vehicles. Uh, we, every day, used to pull into that gravel pit and park in the exact same place. And what the North Vietnamese had done is they had had, had those spots all ready, and the first three rounds came in were direct hits on vehicles. Unfortunately, one of the Jeeps, there were a, a lieutenant and a, a sergeant in it. Uh, I believe it was the lieutenant was killed, the sergeant was wounded. Um, but the worst part of that was, was uh, after it happened, the mortars were still coming in. We were taking in, we were taking on ground fire. Um, we got on our radios, called in ARA, uh, called the first and the ninth to try to get some of their people up there to help us, um, and held them off for about oh, 10 to 15 minutes with sporadic ground fire and, and mortars coming in and whatnot. And, I always remember uh, when this happened, we were just outside the ground, we were just outside the, uh, the uh, gravel pit, and a captain who was in charge of the engineers group went into shock, and he just got up and started running with tears coming down his face. That's how, that's how this thing had affected him. And, and we had to tackle him and hold him down. Uh, he was just, he just gone into shock and, and, and whatnot. And, and, you see these things happen, and, you, and you, you always say to yourself, well, you know, I hope that never happens to me. And, uh, um, again, it's, it's, it's an education that you get, things that you see that, that uh, they never seem to go away. Um, anyway, we were under attack for about 10 minutes. Finally, the ARA ships get there, and they're up above us, and they start rocketing the positions where they think the mortars are coming from and the fire is coming from. And finally, we get a, a, a word from the ARA people that we better get out of there because there's at least 500 to 1,000 North Vietnamese, and they're trying to make a circle around us. They're trying to cut us off. And they said they, we better mount everybody up and get them out of there. So that was our job was to, to mount them up and, and get them out of there. And I always remember uh, we had a kid who was driving a deuce and a half, he got hit in the in the front wheel and blew out the front wheel of his truck. He drove that truck probably eight miles on the rim at about 45 miles an hour. And I don't know how he held it on the road because when we got back, I mean, it was just just amazing to see to to see that truck and, and the rim was just smoking. I mean, it was all everything was all on fire and everything else, but he held that truck on the road for about eight miles at about 45 miles an hour so he wouldn't hold up the rest of the convoy. Um, just little things like that that uh, you just you just never you never forget. I remember one day they're going down the road and I hear bam 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 and I reach for the receiver to call on the radio. I start calling and nothing's happened and I start calling again nothing's happened. I look down and a bullet had penetrated. We were, I was actually sitting on the radio in the back of the Jeep a bullet had actually penetrated the face of the radio and blown the face of the radio off, and I was sitting on the radio. So that's that's how close they come to you sometimes, and uh, that was another interesting experience. Um, the gravel pit experience uh, actually did make the stars and stripes, um, and I do have that article that uh, again is a, is a, uh, a reminder to me as to where I came from and, and what happened to me over there, and, and uh, um, it's it's close to my heart. How did you feel about the M16 over the 14, or which? Well, I trained with the M14, right? And I'm left-handed, so the M14 was very not not very kind to me because when you'd fire an M14, the cartridges would fly up and hit you in the face. The 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 empty cartridges. Being left-handed, you hold the weapon the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. They're made to go the opposite way. So I thought this M16 was going to be much better for me. Um, 
when they gave them to us, uh, I didn't know anything about them. They taught us how to clean them. They taught us how to use them. Um, unfortunately, the first ones we got had the aluminum bolts in them, where you'd fire three rounds and they jam, and you'd have to jack around, fire three more, they jam, jack around, and uh, they weren't they weren't very very good to us. Uh, after about a week and a half, I guess they had figured the problem out. They did give us steel bolts to replace the aluminum bolts in them, so that they worked fine. Uh, M16 was a, was a good weapon, uh, light, uh, you, could, you could beat it up and it would take it. Uh, I actually, for about a month and a half, carried an AK-47, which uh, we, had, we had captured. Um, we weren't supposed to have it, but uh, I had it. Uh, finally, one day, a major saw that I had it in my Jeep, and he took it away from me. <laughs> I imagine he probably has it home over his fireplace someplace. <laughs> But, uh, captured from a GI. <laughs> that was a that was a fine weapon too, the AK-47. Uh, I, I noticed you said here you got to like the uh, M79. M79 grenade launcher. Uh, the one that I had wasn't the one that hooked on the the M14. I just had the little shotgun type, and um, again, never been trained on it or anything like that. But fortunately, we had some infantry guys who worked with us and helped us out and whatnot, and. Uh, got us through most of these things. We were given 60 caliber machine guns for our Jeeps, which we didn't know anything about uh, handling. They, they taught us how to use them. And uh, being in charge of my group, I used to go out every morning, and every morning before we'd start up the road, we would fire every weapon that we had to make sure that it worked correctly. Um, because with an M60 caliber machine gun, if you put the, uh, put the gas cartridge in backward, which you could do, you could fire one round, then you'd have to take the whole unit apart and switch that cartridge so it would work correctly. So I, I never wanted that to happen. So we would always fire our weapons before we went up the road just to make sure that they worked properly and everything was everything was ready to go when we got ready to go. Um, but the M79 was a, was a nice little weapon. Uh, I got so I could take out a tree or a bush or a spot about 200 yards away pretty easy. Uh, they shot a little cartridge like a shotgun shell with a little grenade on the end of it, and uh, got very, very proficient with that. Did you have uh, much contact with the Vietnamese people themselves? Um, not really. Uh, day to day, when the convoys were, were getting ready to go and whatnot, you'd have a lot of Vietnamese people around. we call them Coke girls. They used to sell Coca-Cola and cigarettes and stuff like that to the guys on the truck. Um, they'd hang around the, the, uh, the con convoys before they'd leave. And then usually they'd intercept them on the way back, and, and, and you know. But other than that, not an awful lot of uh, uh, contact with the Vietnamese. At Phuket, there was a uh, Vietnamese uh, training base for Vietnamese. And uh, we used to call them the Boy Scouts of, of Vietnam because uh, they really didn't look much like military units. They looked like Boy Scouts trying to, trying to be military units. Um, but that was the only real contact. There was a Korean uh, unit uh, on our highway, on Highway 1, just north of Phuket, that was very proficient, uh, very, very good unit. Um, but other than that, that, that's about the only contact we had to <coughs> play with them. Um, how were race, race relations like within your unit? Uh, real good. Um, um, to tell you the truth, we were there early, 66, 67. We were too busy every day doing our job to, to, to have problems like that, fortunately, I think. Um, I had a, a fellow in my unit, uh, uh, Tomlin, was his name, Tom Tomlin, um, a, a black fellow that I got to like real well, um, did real well with, and, and, and we had several, you know, uh, uh, the only one, I do remember one problem I did have is we had two Puerto Rican fellows and they would speak Spanish all the time. And one day we got pinned down and they're hollering back and forth to each other in Spanish. And I couldn't understand what they were saying. And when we got back to our base unit, um, I was ready to, I actually took them to the captain. I was gonna write them up I, and I told the captain, I said, when they're out on the road with us, they gotta speak English. I said, I don't care what they speak 
when they're talking to each other. But I said, out on the road, when something's happening, I want to know what's happening. I want to know what they're saying. And the captain did support me. And, and uh, when they were out with me, they, they would speak English instead of Spanish, which, you know, um, was, was difficult. But that's, that's the only real problem that I can ever remember having. And, and it was more of a communication problem. We didn't have any problem with the guys. They were, they were great guys to have in my unit. It was just that when you're under fire, you, you want to be able to understand everybody. Were there any drugs around, do you know, at no, that time? No, at that time, at that time, you know, like the, the, the drivers of the trucks used to, used to smoke quite a bit of marijuana. Um, and to their, to their defense, the reason they did was um, before they came to us at 6 o'clock, they had to get up at a lot of times 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning to go get their truck loaded. Then they would drive over and wait for us till 9 o'clock to go north. They would go up and wait to get unloaded up there, come back with us at 7.30. When they got back, they had to clean their truck, gas it up, and get it ready for the next day. A lot of times, those guys were working on four and five hours sleep at the most. And to keep themselves awake, they would smoke marijuana to, to keep themselves awake. But other than that, um, that, that's, that, that's the only time that I ever saw any drugs, and, and it was... It was almost a necessary evil because when you're traveling at 35 miles an hour, uh, 20 yards apart, in the heat of uh, 90 degrees, you need something to keep you awake. And, and that's what they would do if they'd smoke for marijuana to keep awake. Now, you were wounded. Well, uh, I guess I, I, I was, I had a leg wound. Um, and it, it was up to the military's call whether I was really wounded or not. Um, it actually happened out on the road one day, uh, there was a, a mine in the road, we drove into the hole of the mine and I got a, a cut on my leg. And, um, I didn't think anything of it at the time. Uh, went back to my unit, they cleaned it out, they put five stitches in it, and I was back out working. Um, two or three days later, I wake up middle of the night and from my knee down my leg has swollen up to about three times its size and I've got an infection in that in that wound um, and wound up down in Quinyan in the hospital for about three and a half weeks uh, it was actually they put my leg up in traction and you could thump on my leg with your fist and it was like hitting a leather chair because the skin had turned to almost leather and it was all hollow underneath and they were pumping solution through there to try to get rid of the infection. And every day the doctor would come in and he'd dump on it and he'd look at it and he'd keep going, he wouldn't say anything. Finally about six or seven days after I was there, uh, I stopped him, I said, Doc, what's going on with my leg? And he said, well, it's not getting any better. He said, but it's not getting any worse. So uh, he said, we'll, we'll wait another few days, he said, if it, gets any worse, we'll send you to, we'll send you to Tokyo. And uh, fortunately, three or four days later, it did start to heal up, and, and within three weeks or four weeks, uh, I was all right. But it was interesting, uh, you say wounded. Uh, <laughs> according to the military, according to the story I got from my lieutenant, who you know, went back to our unit with it and whatnot, that it wasn't from hostile fire that I got my, uh, my wound, it was from uh, an accident of driving into a hole where a mine was, so we didn't. I didn't actually get wounded, I guess. But uh, it's always been a bone of contention to me that whether I was wounded or not, I was hurt pretty bad, and I had quite an infection in my leg. <laughs> you said you saw Bob Hope while you were over there. Yes. Yep. Uh, it was uh, December of '66. Uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to we put names in a hat and we pulled pulled the names out, and, and my name came out, uh, put us on a chopper and flew us down to Quinyan. Um, we came down in our field gear with steel pots, hand grenades, M16s, uh, you know, all the gear that we always carried every day and got off the chopper and started to head over to where it was and a uh, lieutenant came up to us and he said, where are you going? And we said, we're going to Bob Hope Show. And he said, well, not dressed like that, you're not. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, uh, he said, well, he says, we can't have you dressed like that. And I said, well, this is all we got. I said, this is where we are. So they took us to a place and they gave us some 
soft caps and nice fatigues to put on. And they actually did put us up in the front row, so we did get to see a, a good Bob show, Hope show. But it was just another one of the little ironies of, of, of uh, Vietnam. We used to pass Phuket Air Force Base every day, and they had air-conditioned barracks. They had mess halls where they ate off in trays and, and, you know, just like in the States and whatnot. And we were eating sea rations. So we would pull in there occasionally to see if we could eat. And uh, I always remember I went to their mess hall, my men, and, and said we'd like to come in and eat. Again, dressed like we were with our hand grenades and our M16s and everything. Oh, you can't come in here like that. I said, what do you mean we can't come in here like this? I said, this, this is the way we are, you know. Oh, he says, we can't allow that. So I said, well, who's in charge? So they got a captain. The captain finally did let us go in, but he made us leave all our weapons and stuff in the Jeep. And one guy had to stay out, watch our stuff, and then he went in and ate, ate after we did. But uh, we walked in there, and it was interesting. The Air Force guys looked at us and thought we were from another planet. Uh, they just they, they couldn't believe that, that uh, we lived like we lived. How long were you in Vietnam? Um, about 11 months. Just about 11 months. When did you leave? Um, August of 67. Uh, that was another interesting story. Um, again, I was out in the field in Bang San uh, doing our convoy escort, POW control, and, and occasionally we did some door gunning for helicopter units. But uh, um, I always remember that uh, I was out on the road, and we actually, our unit got six flights that month to go back to the States. And if you didn't use them up, they'd turn them back, and you'd lose that flight. So I had a friend and personnel down in, down in Quinn Yon, and he put my name on one of those flights. I wasn't really supposed to go for like another two or three weeks. And uh, he put my name on it, so they radioed up, and they said I had to be in Quinn Yon that night, and I had to be at Cameron Bay the next morning to catch a flight out. So uh, that night when I got in off the road, they put me on a Huey, took me to Quinn Yon, and, and uh, put me right on a C-130, which took me down to Cameron Bay. Excuse me a second. You told us, what did you leave, do with all your gear? Oh, I left everything. I left everything right in the field. I mean, I didn't have any paperwork. I didn't have anything. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, the lieutenant in charge of our unit, I said to him, I said, I got orders. He said, you're going. He said, get you on the chopper. And I left everything right there in the field. So you didn't really clear post didn't or clear, turn anything didn't in Didn't turn at all. anything at all. My, my, everything I left right there. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I came down in was, was my fatigues, and I still had my helmet and uh, left everything right there. So we got to uh, Cameron Bay. Um, they had me on the manifest for the flight, but they didn't have any paperwork. And I go, they take me into this place and they tell me that, you know, you don't, you haven't, you haven't cleared post, you haven't, uh, you know, finalized your, your leaving Vietnam. Um, we can't, Send you. I said, well, what happens if you don't, we said, you've got to go back to your unit, and when, you know, we, we get, the, you know, I said, I'm not going back. I said, I'm going to tell you that right now. I said, I'm going to be on that flight. And fortunately enough, uh, there, was, there was a lieutenant there who, who helped me out, and uh, they gave me a pair of, uh, at that time they were just changing over from the, from the khakis, the summer khakis, to the, to the greens, the summer greens, and they didn't have any of the summer greens, so they gave me a pair of the khakis, the old khakis, and uh, I wore them, no insignia, no rank, no name tag, uh, a shirt, pair of pants, and a pair of shoes, um, and put me on the plane. Uh, we flew back to Seattle, Washington. I got there. Um, we came in at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, all of us, probably about 180, 190 of us, all real happy to be back in the States. Uh, it was another little irony of, of, of the Vietnam sequence. When we get back at 2.30 in the morning, there wasn't anybody there to greet us. Uh, we get off the plane tired, um, just happy to be back, but there were no bands, there was nobody to shake our hand, there was nobody to, to uh, it was like, kind of like we were sneaking back into the country in the middle of the night. Um, they put us in a big uh, hangar, and we slept on the floor till, till about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And they started to process us and whatnot. Uh, when they came to me, they didn't have any paperwork, so they said they couldn't process 
process me and whatnot. Um, they didn't have any, you know, they had my, I had my orders. They had a copy of my orders to be there, but they didn't have anything else. So uh, they said I'd have to stay there until my stuff caught up with me. And there were myself and probably about eight other guys that were in that same situation as I was. And we got pretty hot under the collar and said that they better get some MPs to watch us because as soon as nobody was watching us, we were going to be gone because I was actually, that was the end of my, my service career. And I was out of the service. I was just going to be mustered out of the service. So actually a captain did stand up for us and go to work for us and uh, found some paperwork. Got, got things done for us, uh, put us through the medical medical portion um, there at, at Seattle and, and got the paperwork done for us. And we did get out the next the next day at 11. So in 72 hours, I went from the Bang San plane to Seattle, Washington in a, in a civilian, as a civilian uh, in 72 hours. And, and I always think back on that and, and um, it's really not enough time for a person to process what's going on or what's happened to them. Uh, when I got home, um, I was a confused kid for probably two or three weeks, uh, just trying to figure out who I was and what I was going to do. Fortunately, uh, a good friend of mine got me involved in, in, in going to college, and, and I did go to college. Uh, did you use the GI Bill at all? Or? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Did. Fortunately, used a GI Bill and, and did get to go to school. But um, I've often told people that, that I would never trade that year for any year of my life. Um, it taught me so much about who I was, about other people, and about what can happen to people um, under very stressful circumstances. Um, it, I've been in management for, for 32 years, and I've always tried to use those practices in my management uh, career. Um, there are people you can count on and there are people that you can't count on. And very quickly, Vietnam taught me to sort those people out and to count on the people that you can. And the people that you can't count on, you have to discount them and, and let them go to the side and, and you know, work with the people that you know you can count on. Mm -hmm. um, and I've used that through my whole life. Uh, it's helped my I often remember I came from Greenwich. I was just a high school kid that didn't do very well in high school. I played sports, um, and uh, it, it changed my life. It made me decide to go to college. Interesting, interesting little thing with my state trooper thing. I came back and took the state trooper test. Uh, finished 283rd on the list. They called 500 that year. I went down and couldn't pass the physical because of my leg. But I was never wounded in Vietnam. <laughs> so I never became a state trooper, uh, which was my which was my plan in the first place because of, of uh, not being able to pass the physical. So things happen to you. You go on and, and you, you uh, something I would like to kind of wrap this thing up with is, is it, um, I got back, I didn't say anything for about 10 years. And then I joined the, uh, the uh, Vietnam Veterans Organization. And um, at that time, there was a lot of controversy about Vietnam veterans and this and that and, and whatnot. And, and uh, it bothered me because 90 to 95 percent of us were active, hardworking people in society. And the 5 percent that weren't were the ones that were getting all the publicity and getting all the all the uh, um, pictures and, and all the all the you know information put out about them and whatnot and I always remember I said to them that we were going to march in a parade one one veterans day and I said you know what we ought to do we ought to dress in the clothes that we wear to work every day and put a sign around our neck saying I'm a postman or I'm a manager or I'm a you know so that society can see that not all Vietnam veterans go around in camouflage shirts with beards and, and you know, wanting something. You know what I mean? Um, and it, it has bothered me for a good many years that we never did that because, like I said, I think 95% of the Vietnam veterans came back 
went into society and became productive people. Um, unfortunately, our people, our, our, our rap is that we were troublemakers. We were, you know, uh, another thing that kind of bothered me when I came back, I came from a small town in Greenwich, New York, and uh, was a football player, a basketball player, well known in, in a small town, 3,000 people, big family, they knew our family. I came home from Vietnam, the Legion or the VFW never offered me a drink, never called me to come over and have a drink. Um, I've always, it's always bothered me that because I guess because I was a Vietnam veteran, um, they really didn't, they knew I was home uh, in a small town like that. Uh, and, it, and it has always bothered me that they never offered to have me come over and have a drink. Did you ever join any veterans or I used to belong to Legion here in town. Uh, that was another, uh, I had a bad experience with that. Um, actually got into Legion and became an officer in Legion post-70. Um, it was at the time when Jimmy Carter was president. And uh, Jimmy Carter had just made his decision that the invaders in Canada could come back under an amnesty. And uh, we had a big dinner over at the Gideon Putnam, and actually the president of the, of the Legion was there. And I was fortunate enough to sit at the table with him, because I had the table being an officer and whatnot, and uh, we were discussing things and whatnot. And he said, well, does anybody have any questions? And I raised my hand, and I said, what's the Legion's stance on Jimmy Carter letting these... Uh, these uh, draft evaders come back into the states. And he thought for a minute and he said, well, he said, that's a political issue, he said, and, and we don't really have a stance on that. And I said to him, well, I said, to me it's near and dear. And I said, uh, if we don't take a stance, I said, who will? And he didn't have an answer for me. And that kind of soured me, on the unfortunately. I mean, they're good groups, they're good organizations, but uh, um, I think they missed the boat on that one. Um, why don't we go to a new tape, because I will put pictures in there. Oh, we're rolling again. Okay, could okay. you tell us about this item that you brought in? If you just hold it sure. uh, like this, Wayne can focus okay. on it. And, and yep. Well, um, this is some of the propaganda uh, that we would find along the road. Um, a lot of times you'd see it there around Vietnamese holidays or, or, or special days for them, religious days or whatever they were. I really don't even know what this says, um, but it is some kind of, of propaganda. I do have some other information that, that uh, we, have, we had picked up along now, the way. Now, what was that, nailed to a tree? This was nailed what? to a tree, uh -huh. yep. Uh, you'd find it nailed to a tree or, or hung someplace. Uh -huh. um, uh, and and they would do it at night. We would go out in the daytime and, and take them all down, and then and, and you'd go back through maybe a week later, and there'd be, there'd be more of them, uh, trying to influence the people in that area. Um, and it, it was quite interesting. Uh, like I say, I do have some other things that, that we picked up that are like this. Uh -huh. okay. um, could you maybe show us that series of photographs you have over okay. there? This little grouping here um, has hung by my desk wherever I've worked. Yes. And the reason it hangs there is because uh, when things are tough and when, when, when you're having a bad day, you can always look up at this and say, Chuck, this is nothing compared to what you, what you used to do. Um, it's actually some pictures that were taken when I was over there. Uh, there's the article that hit the uh, stars and stripes with my name in it uh, telling about the incident we had in the gravel pit. Um, and, and again, it's, it's kind of a little synopsis of what happened to me, and, and for me anyways, it brings back a lot of... Now memories. these are all from Vietnam? These are so. all from Vietnam, the pictures, Now yes. what are the modifications on the Jeep that you have there? Oh, okay. Um, we used to travel in, in groups of two, the Jeeps did. Uh, you'd have a lead Jeep and a, and a follow Jeep. We'd stay probably two or three hundred yards apart. Um, our biggest our biggest enemy were mines and, and uh, quick sporadic fire from, from the side of the road. 
Um, most of our Jeeps, when we got there, were not armored in any way. They were just open 151s. Um, so what we did is, is we put armor plating on the doors around the side, across the back, and across the front where the windshield would be. Um, just to try to give us a little protection so if we did take rounds in the side of the road you could kind of duck down and be protected. Uh, our jeeps on the floors were, were sandbagged. Um, you'd sandbag the floor, the driver's side, the rider's side, and the complete back. Um, we also mounted 60 caliber machine guns on, on uh, turrets in the back of the jeep so that we'd have more firepower if we needed it. Um, most of these modifications were done by ourselves uh, nights. Uh, you'd go out on the day and uh, during the day and, and do your convoy work, and at night you'd come back and modify your Jeep to try to make it a little safer the next day. Um, one real problem we ran into, though, the, the plating that we used um, was not hardened plating. It was just regular metal plating. And after the Vietnamese figured out that uh, armor-piercing bullets would pierce it, uh, they did a job on us because what it would do is it would pierce the metal and it would actually make the metal into shrapnel which Friday. made it worse for you. So so uh, we weren't as smart as we thought we were sometimes, but it worked for a while. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other photographs you want to talk about here? Um, I do have I do have a couple of interesting photographs. I, I don't know if you'd be able to see them. Um, no, we should be able to if you hold them up in okay. front of you. Sorry. Or you should be able to zoom right in on it. I'll find the box on bridge. Now, did you take a camera with you? No, I, we, I bought a camera over oh, okay. when I was there. And, and, uh, I noticed most of your photographs are black and white. Is there any reason why you didn't that's, take that many that's, color? That's the only film we could, I could oh, get really? at that time. Okay. Yep, yep. It, was, it was hard to find. Uh, I'm looking for a, 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 a here it is. Um, this I find very interesting. Uh, this on this side is a picture of the Bang San Bridge after we had let it down by bombing it. Uh, you can see that if, if, if you can get close enough, it actually lays into the river where, where we had taken a couple of sections out. Mm -hmm. On this side is the new Bang San Bridge that we built about 200 yards or 300 yards down the road from where the old Bonson Bridge was. So, six months difference, we lay it down, we move in, and we build our own bridge. So, it, it was quite interesting, I thought, that, that uh, how, how the military works. We, we, we wreck it, and then we go back and we build it back, back up. And uh, it was one of, the, one of the interesting things that I had. Now, those uh, two lower photographs, is that a church? Yes, those are bombed out churches that were along the road. Um, and, and, you know, where as, as they moved up the road, you'd see a lot of destruction, um, you know, because they, they moved in, in jumps and leaps. And Highway 1 ran north and south in Vietnam uh, from Quinh Yan. It ran north toward Da Nang. Mm -hmm. And... That was part of our job, was to work up that, and then off Highway 1, we worked into Bonson, which is up, took us out to the Bonson Plain, which was a big area that the cab was working. Um, there was another interesting photo that I had here. It was the inside of an APC, an NA personnel carrier, that had gone up the road ahead of us that had hit a mine... Here it is, right here. Um, they had gone up ahead of us, and unfortunately, they hit a mine. It was an artillery shell that had been buried into the ground. Uh, they had two 30 caliber machine guns on the top of it. It blew them off, and we found them almost 150 yards away from from that APC. The four guys were killed in that that day, but uh, we we had the unfortunate job of going up and picking it up you know, after it happened and whatnot. Um, it, mines, like I say, were the, were, the, were the scariest thing for us over there. I can remember one day, I'm driving down the road, I hear a large, thunderous boom, and I look in my rear view mirror, and there's a five-ton truck 
going up on its side and rolling over. Fortunately, we were light enough to go over it and didn't set it off, but when the five-ton truck got to it, it was heavy enough to set it off. And uh, no one got hurt that day, but it was just kind of interesting to look in your rear view mirror and see this large mushroom cloud and a truck rolling over on the side after hitting a mine that you had just driven over. Now, were you aware of the anti-war movement? N not an awful lot. Um, it, it probably wasn't. It wasn't, that, it wasn't quite as big know. as it got in 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 eight in '68 and '69, mm -hmm. um, and it didn't. You must have been on college campus then. About yeah, I was. I was. I was on college campus. How then. did you? How did the students react to you? Did they know you were? They, a veteran? most of them didn't know, uh -huh. and most of them I didn't tell. Um, it's interesting. Uh, my wife. Uh, when we were going together, I met her in college, and she didn't know for six months. We'd been going together for six months before I told her I'd been to Vietnam. Um, because, you know, because of the, the anti-military anti feeling at that time. Um, I always remember when I was in Cobleskill, I was a bartender down there when I was going to school, and we had a kid come in one day, you know, Sunday afternoon, and he was telling us about how he was a conscientious objector and had gone to Canada about six or eight months prior, before, because they were looking for him. And uh, another friend of mine who was a veteran, a veteran was bartending with me, and, and uh, we actually got on the phone and called Albany, got a hold of the FBI, and explained to him we had this guy, and he was at the bar, and he was, you know, and they said, well, you keep him there. So we went out and we were giving this guy free drinks and whatnot. And about an hour and a half later, the FBI came down and arrested the kid sitting at the bar uh, because uh, he was a conscientious objector and left the States and they were looking for him. They actually had a warrant for him. And uh, that, that was kind of gratifying to us. Do you ever read much about Vietnam? I do. Uh, How about uh, movies? It's interesting. People ask me about movies and... and there are parts of the movies that bring back reality. There are parts of the movies that are that are theatrical, and, and they they uh, they, um, they they've got it blown way out of proportion for for me, anyways. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine some guys maybe maybe had seen some of the things. There's a couple of scenes that I can remember from different movies, and 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 the one is of the heat when the guy gets out of the, when the kid goes to Vietnam and. And I, I, I want to say it's the 4th of July movie or one of those movies where they drop the back of a C-130 and he goes out, out onto the runway and you can just feel the heat. It, 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 the movie portrays that, portrays that very well. Another time was, was in, um, I think it's the either Platoon or one of the other movies that there's confusion in a village and I can always remember this because because it used to happen to us we didn't have any interpreters with us and confusion would be going on and the Vietnamese would be howling and yelling and, 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 and saying things and going back and forth and this and that and you didn't know what was going on and the confusion would scare you I mean because you didn't know what these people were saying you didn't know whether they were on our side or their side, and not being able to understand what they were saying made you made you take a defensive posture more than more than a, 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 a any other posture towards them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I can always remember in in, a, in one movie where, where I guess they're trying to they're trying to get some information out of a person, and they have a little kid, and he's holding a 45 to red, and the Vietnamese are howling and yelling in the background and all this stuff and everything else. And just that confusion of not knowing what goes on really brought some, some memories back to me because that's what would happen a lot of times with us when we'd get to an incident and you couldn't sort out who was saying what and what they were telling you until you finally got an interpreter there, which, which would be very difficult a lot of times for us. I, I always remember another little thing that just came to me in education. Um, we had a lieutenant that was in charge of us, Larry Coleman was his name, right out of Roxy, nice guy, I mean, just, just you know, the same age as we were, I was 20, he was 21, 
Um, we're going up the road. We'd only been there probably a week and a half. He stops his Jeep, pulls it off to the side. He's got his map laid out on the hood of the Jeep. You know, I'm second in command. I'm only at E4, but I'm second in command there. I walk up and I'm asking him what's going on. And he's saying, I'm trying to figure out where the hell we are. And I'm looking at him and saying, you're in charge, and you're trying to figure out where the hell we are. What about the rest of us? Fortunately, we, we, we got figured out where we were and, and moved on and whatnot. But that, the, the, the lack of training in our, in our unit anyways, and a lot of the units that I saw over there was just, was just scary. Uh, I see these kids going to Iraq now, and I, I know a kid that, that has been to Iraq twice, um, captain, very well trained, very well prepared for what he was going to. You know what I mean? Um, with us, uh, very poorly trained, very poorly prepared for where we were going. And not, not just one guy, to the man in our unit. Um, we, we, it, it took us a good three months to figure out what we were doing and, and how we were doing it, which was scary. To the, to the military's credit now, I think they, they, they do prepare them at least before they go so that they know a little bit about the, the culture of the country. They know a little bit about what's going on. They know why they're there or, or, or you know, have some idea why they're there. They know what their, what their unit's uh, um, objectives are and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, with us, we, we were just there and, and doing a, a job daily that we really didn't understand, I don't think. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you. Oh, did you want to show us this uh, painting on oh, velvet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, this is a little thing that I picked up in, in downtown Bonsign one day. They, they used to do these. They'd have them all made up, and then they'd, they'd add your name. It's got my name on it, and, and it's got our unit on it. Um, it's got the year that I was there, 66, 67. Um, just kind of a little keepsake to bring home. Now, what is that on? It's, um, it's obviously some sort of disc. But yeah, but it's just a piece of poster board. Oh, I see. Okay. It's just a cheap piece of, I don't know, the, something they had found or cardboard or something that they had found. Probably a and, piece of packing or yep, something. Yeah, or something, and then they just, they just made it up and, and had them for sale. Uh, again, it was just a, another little thing that I picked up over there. I do have a short timer's calendar, but I don't know if we can want to show that on the, okay. on the video. Okay.